Okay. <clears throat> well, um, thank you all, and uh, thank you to the organizers very much for the invitation. And I just want to uh, mention one thing. Thank you also to the uh, Fetzer Foundation and the Fetzer Institute. When I was a first-year graduate student, um, they gave me a small grant, which actually allowed me to do my PhD with, with Yakir Aronov. And um, I, I'm not sure I submitted a final report. Uh, it's a little late. Let's consider this a final report, and maybe you can determine the return on investment. OK. So um, <clears throat> I, I was really appreciated Jan's talk, and I wanted to kind of integrate a little bit of a response to it. Um, <clears throat> and he asked about uh, the question of emergent quantum mechanics, or I, I took that to mean generalizations of quantum mechanics, new, uh, you know, things that are perhaps not equal to what we currently understand as quantum mechanics. And um, I believe the critical issue is to, in order to make progress, is to start with the axioms of the theory. So the axioms of the theory of quantum mechanics are um, uh, not in particularly good shape, but at least the relationship between those axioms and the things that we consider non-locality and relativity is uh, something that Abner Shimoni characterizes peaceful coexistence. In some sense, these are sort of derivative concepts from the, the deeper axioms. Um, and Yakir is fond of saying that those axioms of quantum mechanics are not intuitive. He says it's like, it's like trying to derive special relativity from the wrong axioms, and it doesn't make sense, right? It looks very complicated. But if you get the right axioms of special relativity, it's, it's, it's very trivial. And this reflects a situation uh, that actually Woody Allen um, very... Uh, 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 characterized very well in one of his movies. So this guy goes to a psychiatrist and says, uh, Doc, my brother's crazy. He thinks he's a chicken. And so the psychiatrist says, well, why don't you, you know, send him to the hospital? And the guy says, I would, but I need the eggs. And so it's really just like quantum mechanics. The theory from an axiomatic perspective looks crazy, but we need the fruits of the theory. We need the eggs. So uh, rather than taking this approach, we look at axioms such as non-locality, causality, or relativity. And from that, try to derive the uncertainty, for example, of, of quantum mechanics. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, was an enterprise that was started by Sandra Popescu and, and, and Danny Rorlick, um, um, inspired by Yakir. Both, both did their PhDs with Yakir as well. And um, <clears throat> this has a bunch of results. I'm trying to, I'll try to mention a few of them, including one of the uh, issues that Feynman brought up that he said would never be solved. I remember when he said that in one of his, in the classes I attended, um, and we tried to solve that. But just to give you an example, if we do take quantum uncertainty as ontic, this is one of the questions that Jan raised, is it ontic or is it epistemic? Um, there may be deep reasons for this. For, so we could derive such uncertainty from axioms like non-locality, the relevance of future to present, I'll talk about it a little bit, causality as a deep axiom, and even things such as free will. So I'll get into this. Also, I thought I would, you know, there's a lot of non-scientists in the audience, so I'm trying to uh, um, uh, do a combination a talk uh, to both the non-scientists and the physicists. Um, so let's talk about uh, uncertainty, de determinism versus not determinism, de determinism. Here we have Newton's laws, as you recognize, in um, taking place in Skylab. And this has resulted in uh, very good theories in physics. Uh, macroscopic determinism works very well. We can predict all kinds of extraordinary things. Here's, I think, uh, calculating uh, Milky Way smashing into Andromeda in, I don't know, 100 million years or something like that. It's to the black holes smashing into each other. So clearly it works very well. Now, on the other hand, on a quantum mechanical level, we have this extraordinary situation that here's an orbital for an electron, and uh, this orbital decays in one minute, say, and emits a photon. And we have an exactly identical orbital, same exactly way, as identical as it can possibly be, but that orbital decays in one hour. So there was absolutely no difference between them in the beginning, but they behave completely differently later on. And this is what drove Einstein crazy. He says, you know, God does not play dice. Mm -hmm. So our group has tried to ask the question, well, as far as we can tell, there is playing dice. There is uncertainty at a fundamental level. Why play the dice? Why 
you know, it seemed kind of depressing. You know, from, we started in classical mechanics, we had all these beautiful things, we could predict the future, um, and then we lost that, right? And so what did we gain from it? What did we get from it? Um, the traditional answer is just, well, stuff happens. Nature is capricious. Uh, that didn't seem particularly satisfying. Um, so this is one answer that uh, Yakir originally proposed uh, almost 50 years ago, that that uncertainty actually exactly allows quantum mechanics to independently select both initial and final boundary conditions of a single system. So that led to this theory <coughs> that's become known as the time-symmetric reformulation of quantum mechanics, or TSQM, and the basic idea there is instead of having just a single state, the usual standard picture of quantum mechanics, we have two states. One that goes from the preparation at time t1, another one that goes backwards in time from the later post-selection or post-preparation at time t2. And then you ask questions about the system at the intermediate time t, and this object, which is not a scalar product, but uh, really these, these two state vectors, gives you the complete specification of any question that you might ask in that intermediate time. So this is really different from classical mechanics. If we knew exactly the state of a system classically, its position and the momentum precisely, and we knew all the interactions that the system went through, we could predict precisely what its later position and momentum would be. On the other hand, quantum mechanics, even if we knew everything in principle, this is what this abstract symbol means, it's a ket vector in, in Hilbert space, we knew exactly what that initial state was, we knew what all the interactions are, these all should be different by the way, but we, we couldn't predict exactly what the later state would be. So that's, that's the basic issue. So what can we say at the intermediate time, uh, T, between preparing a system in one state, psi, and post-preparing it later in a time, T? So here we, this interaction is meant to represent sort of like a measurement, measuring the property A. <laughs> okay, so that was given by um, this famous paper by Yakir and Peter Bergman and Joel Lebowitz in 1964. It's called the ABL formula. It looks a little complicated, but the main thing I want to emphasize here is that here we have a time evolution that evolves this state forward in time from time T1 to time T up to here. And then we have another thing which evolves the outcome of the measurement at this intermediate time T. It evolves that from time T to time T2 and then projects, uh, take, takes the outcome here, which is A sub J, and that projects it up to the later time. But there's a very simple and universal symmetry that you can use here, which is instead of projecting this one forward, you can project your post-selection backwards. And so that's the usual thing, projecting it forward. And in this case, instead of applying that time evolution from T to T2 onto the outcome of the intermediate measurement here, we can apply it backwards in time from T2 to T on the post-selection uh, phi. So that gives you this, this time symmetric picture of quantum mechanics. So this is a reformulation of the standard picture of quantum mechanics, right? Why would you do that? I mean, already quantum mechanics is, you know, the most successful theory in history. You know, this is, you know, it, in some sense, everything that we have predicted in this theory, you could also, you know, hypothetically get from the standard picture. So there's a set of uh, metrics that we try to apply whenever we do this kind of reformulation business. First of all, we insist that a new theory be consistent, of course, with standard quantum mechanics, as it must. And this is a real simple thing. I won't go, the proof is, is, is completely trivial. Whenever you see these, you take these conjugates, uh, as you see throughout quantum mechanics, it's like taking a state backwards in time. So that's it. It's consistent with standard quantum mechanics. The second aspect of the metric that we insist it satisfy is that it should bring out new features in quantum mechanics that you never would have seen before if you didn't adopt this new perspective. And so one example of that that I'll just spend a little bit of time on is weak values. There's many other, many other examples of it I won't have time to talk about. The third metric is that <clears throat> it should lead to simplifications and calculations. It should stimulate discoveries in other fields. I'll talk a little bit about that. And the holy grail, and this is uh, the speculative part, is that if it should ever turn out to be the case that we need to change quantum mechanics, if the experimentalist should ever find that you know, quantum mechanics is incorrect, then you would need to generalize quantum mechanics or uh, um, uh, come up with an emergent quantum mechanics. And so 
this picture has such different conceptual uh, underpinnings, uh, it may lead you to a new generalization. So I'll talk about some examples of that. So first of all, I'll talk about uh, number two, weak values. So again, here's the picture. You got two vectors. Here's your ABL formula. So one new thing that came out of it was this uh, thing called the weak measurement and the weak value, um, first proposed by Aharonov, Albert, and Weidman. And here it is right here. I'll talk about this in a little more detail. So if you're just doing a strong measurement interaction, all that means is that here's your pointer of your measuring device, and you're simply looking very carefully, looking, what we would say, strongly at your system, then ABL will give you the wave function of your measuring device, in which the usual thing that we've come to learn, that it's centered around the quantized values of the observable, the eigenvalues, and it gives the relative weights, the relative probabilities by which you would find those. And this is kind of like hitting your um, far wave function with a sledgehammer, um, because it looks like, if you believe, uh, if you believe in reality, <laughs> that it looks like there's something called the collapse of the wave function. Instead of having states that look like this, you have one outcome, one possible reality. And a way of just sort of generalizing this is, <clears throat> if this is a system you're looking at, and this is your measuring device, what happens here, this is the wave function, this is the initial wave function of measuring device. It's characterized by a spread, for example, in momentum. This is the shift due to the interaction between your probe and the measuring device. And you simply want a condition that the shift is greater than the spread. This means you can just tell that the measure, you can tell the, the point of your measuring device started here and ended there. That's it. That's a good, ideal, strong measurement. Um, nobody has any objection to that. And that's given by, again, by ABL. And when that happens, we create another boundary condition here. It's, the system is collapsed onto some eigenfunction of that observable A. And the picture in the time symmetric uh, perspective is that you actually create two boundary conditions, one going forwards and one going backwards. Mm -hmm. The other regime is a weak measurement. I just want to mention that this is actually um, the 25th birthday of this famous paper um, by uh, Yakir Haronov and David Albert and Lev Leibman. So it's the same kind of setting. We use the same kind of measurement theory. We just turn down the knob, you know. It's just less, less strongly interacting. And when you do that, the measuring device registers this thing called the weak value of the observable A. And again, it's given by this expression right here, which is a kind of a, a strange expression. This looks like the usual things we calculate in quantum mechanics, transition amplitudes. But then we divide by the scalar product between the pre-selected state and the post-selected state. And well, things start to get a little bit strange there. In general, this entity is not constrained by the eigenvalue spectrum. It's not even constrained to be a real number, so on and so forth. But the kind of picture here is that instead of hitting it with a sledgehammer, you're kind of gently interacting with uh, the wave function without causing a disturbance. And so you can actually prove that the whole idea here is that you're able to, at least as a limiting process, you're able to gain information about the system without disturbing it. And so just to compare the previous picture with, uh, with what's happening here, um, here you have the initial state of your measuring device, and it has a certain width, delta p, and here's the shift. But because you're just looking at it very gently, you're not getting a lot of information. It's not getting kicked very much. And so for the most part, the final wave function of measuring device mostly overlaps with the initial uh, state of your measuring device. And this does not create a boundary condition. So during the entire time between, between the initial preparation and the final post preparation, it's characterized by these two vectors. Now, this is, there's more general ways of doing this, but this is, uh, this is, not, you know, well, this, this, this is good enough for our, our, our purposes here. So uh, we could apply this to spin examples. And sort of the famous way of doing this is with something called the Stern-Gerlach uh, setup. Uh, Stern-Gerlach, you just uh, suppose you have something that has a spin, like a little uh, magnetic uh, um, moment to it. And you put it through this, uh, these magnetic fields. And you see that you have a photographic plate over here. And you see you have uh, two quantized values, a, an up and a down, so to speak. Suppose we were to start this state in, uh, in a position of spin x in the, in the plus one direction. You put it through this um, kind of a, a magnet. Um, then that will split in z into two possible values. So the point is that is the Stern-Gerlach can be both a preparation, a pre-selection device, and also a, me a measurement of the spin. Um, 
Also, if we were to do incompatible measurements, suppose we were to start off with x plus and then do, put it through a z measurement so we get, and then we filter it, right? We cut off the z minus right here. So we're just putting through a, a, a z plus into the second magnet. And even though we started off with an x plus here, we can end up with an x plus and an x minus. So this is what is the general, general feature of it. And here's the basic setup for a weak measurement. So here we prepare the system in some state. Then we just have a weak magnet, meaning it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a large inhomogeneity in the field. And then we subsequently do a, a post-selection measurement. And we look at what comes out later, and it turns out this thing is shifted by this weak uh, this weak interaction, and the amount that it's shifted could be much greater than what it should be according to the quantization conditions of, of quantum mechanics. Now, one other thing, this is a little more complicated uh, weak measurement that I'm not going to get into, but I want to emphasize one thing. These are the eigenvalues. This is actually as if you were measuring a ferromagnet, and so those are the possible eigenvalues. That's the state of your measuring device afterwards. I kind of showed a picture of that earlier. This blue thing is um, what your wet measuring device wave function looks like if you did a weak measurement. So again, remember that the weak measurement can't tell the difference between these different eigenvalues, right? And then, you know, I'm doing a post-selection, and you may see something absolutely extraordinary, something that's impossible according to standard quantum mechanics. In this case, you see the spin of this ferromagnet. It's being actually 40% bigger than it should be allowed. And it's way out here in the tail, right? This little red dot right here. But you see, it's always the case that that red, that little spot, is always less than the height of the uncertainty in your measuring device. This is crucial. Um, so the probability to obtain these weak values is always less than just the probability of getting them as an error of the measuring device. And this is forced on you by the condition of weakness. You your measuring device has to look something like this if you're going to do weak measurement. And so, in some sense, this, this, uh, uh, <laughs> this allows you to have your cake and eat it too. This kind of uh, non-locality in time implies, it demands this kind of uncertainty, kind of makes it ontic in value. Um, we'll get into that more as to the importance of that, the richness of, of, of this sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's, oh, there's a, uh, um, we wrote a review of this if you're interested. There's some copies out there on the, on the desk. Um, that goes into more depth than what I'm able to do here. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of, of strange situations. Probably you've all heard of some of these. There's one called the three box paradox. I won't go into too much detail, but it's a situation where you have one particle, three boxes. You put it in a superposition of being in the three boxes. That's your preparation, your pre selection. Later on, you do a, a, a post selection. Still one particle in three boxes, slightly different phase. There's a minus there instead of a plus there. And uh, turns out that there's a very general theorem. Um, theorem says that if, if the ABL formula predicts the outcome of your intermediate measurement with certainty, then uh, this means that the weak value will also be equal to that, um, to that eigenvalue that's predicted by the ABL. And so then we have this weak value logic, which can be applied all over the place. So this means that in this situation, ABL will predict that for certain, if you were to open this box in the intermediate time, 100% of the time, you will find the particle in that box, right? And you can see this intuitively because if you just if you subtract out the A, which you have left as a B plus C, and that's orthogonal to B minus C. So it must be the case that you always find the particle in box A. By this theorem, it means that if you, were to weakly font, if you were to weakly measure how many particles are in box A, you will always see that there is one particle in box A weakly. Uh, but ABL also tells you that um, the number of particles in box B, should that be the only one that you open, is 100% too. You always find a particle in box B. And you can see this intuitively again. Suppose it's not just by de you know, deduction. Suppose by, it's not in box B, so you trace out that, that B. That leaves A plus C, and that is orthogonal to A minus C. Therefore, it must be the case that 100% of the time, if, if you're only opening one box, you will always find it in box B. And by this theorem, this also means that if you were to look weakly, 100% of the time you would see one particle in box B. Um, the extraordinary thing about weak values, since they don't disturb the state of the system, 
is whereas with ABL, I can only ask one of those questions. With weak measurements, I can ask all of these simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, there is only one particle, so the probability of being in box A plus B plus C has got to be equal to one. This also means that the weak value of those probabilities also has got to be equal to one. So guess how many particles, particles, quote unquote, uh, there are in box C? Well, uh, the prediction of the weak value logic is that there's minus one. Well, that doesn't make any sense. How can you possibly have less than zero particles? What it means is that any property that you connect to um, will behave in the opposite way than what, from what you expect. If it's a charged particle, if it's an electron, it'll look like it's you know, positively charged. Um, mass, it'll look like it has negative mass, for example. And there have been several experiments to do this, uh, notably by, by Ephraim Steinberg's group. Um, and uh, <clears throat> here's an example of this experiment has been done. Here's an, ex uh, an example of doing it with mass. Um, so uh, in this box, it looks like there is minus n particles. This is the way you would set it up in the interferometer. Um, so usually gravity attracts, right? But in this case, gravity repels. And the moral of the story here is that this is a very general feature of physics. Anytime you have a uh, weak interaction and you simply do a, a post selection, it will reflect the weak value. Uh, one other quick note. Um, one of the big puzzles in, in the foundations of quantum theory has been situations that are called counterfactuals. And it turns out every time you find a situation that would normally be characterized as a counterfactual, you can actually probe these things with weak measurements and uh, uh, put some traction on what would normally be considered as counterfactual situations. So for example, in my, uh, my PhD thesis, um, again, thanks to Fetzer, I became very interested in <clears throat> a paradox that Lucian Hardy put together, and this is, looks a little bit complicated, but uh, he put two Mach Zener interferometers, he put an electron in one and a positron in the other, um, and normally these are arranged, if, the, if there wasn't this overlap region, you would always see the electron here and always see the positron there, but once you have a region of overlap, sometimes these detectors can go off, and, and it leads to a contradiction, because the only way that those detectors can go off is if the electron took this path and the positron took that path. If they did that, they should annihilate. And uh, of course, that, that's, that's not what happens. And this is usually, th the way people got around this is said, well, if you actually looked, that's a nice you know, logical argument, but if you actually looked to see where the particle was, for example, here's the detector right here, you would kick it so hard that you, the, the usual counterfactual uh, logic would no, longer help, would no longer hold, because just the simple act of doing this measurement interaction could kick the particle in its detector without having to argue that they were both in the overlapping region. But again, you can look at this thing weakly. You can measure the number of particles uh, weakly along each path. And so similarly to the three box situation, if you look at uh, the pairwise occupation, the number of particles that took this path and that path, for example, connect them with a spring, you would again see that it's something like a weak, num weak, weak value of the number of particles that is also negative. And uh, there's been several experiments done in that as well, one by, by you from this group and the other, another one in, in, uh, in Japan. And that got a lot of uh, publicity. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let me talk about something uh, new. This is a paper just published a few weeks ago, um, which is really very extraordinary and particularly, I think, relevant to, to Fetzer and to talk that, that, Ephraim gave, uh, that uh, Jan gave. So it's something called the correspondence principle, which has been uh, sort of one of our um, sacred principles in, in the study of, of, of quantum mechanics. Um, basically, uh, it, it seems to be the case, although it's not required, but it has always been the case as from everything that we've looked at. When we take the classical limit of quantum mechanics, it seems to be a very benign situation that goes on. For example, if you have increasing mass, the wave packets will be narrower. So here's actually a, the, uh, the wave function for a particle. Uh, that's the, you can't see the colored stuff, which shows the real and imaginary parts of the wave function. The white dot is just the classical Newtonian particle you're throwing up in the air in a gravitational field. And you can see it follows pretty well, right? The, the wave packet given by quantum mechanics uh, tracks as it must, right? Because we've proven Newtonian physics. And so the, if quantum mechanics were to be correct, and of course it's proven to be correct, it's got to do that. So 
Um, and then similarly, if you have a, perhaps a, a more spread out wave function as in this case, still as a limiting, uh, uh, limiting case, it behaves in a very, very benign way. Um, so we looked at situations involving quantum optics, and it seems uh, that the, the, uh, the relation between quantum optics and uh, geometric optics, or waved optics, the classical version is, is pretty simple. Uh, we've proven it's not so. In fact, the, taking the correspondence is, is dramatically more involved. So much so that we have to throw many of our intuitions out of the window. And um, what is also particularly interesting is this is a, a very nice uh, guide to all kinds of new quantum effects that we're looking at. Um, so here's the kind of setup. I'm not going to go through the detailed calculations of this. Um, the setup is, is as follows. You've, we've got uh, three mirrors, right? These little gray guys right here. Those mirrors in that configuration. Uh, they're silvered um, on both sides. Oh, and then we have this M. Is, I'm sorry, this M right here. That uh, mirror is silvered on both sides, or reflects on both sides. Um, and this thing is arranged in such a way that this mirror right here gets a kick from the photons that come here, and then it kind of gets recycled and gets a kick on the other side from the photons coming from there. Um, and we uh, arrange the geometry uh, somewhat carefully to emphasize a, a point that we want to make here. Um, these beam slitters right here, these guys, these are identical. And we just, uh, it's, it's a, this is a very general phenomena. It, it's easiest to arrange a situation where the free reflectivity of these beam splitters is greater than the transmissivity, transmissivity, transmissivity of, the, of, of the, uh, the beam splitters. So suppose we send in a macroscopic beam of intensity i, right? Send in a macroscopic beam right here. Um, we did the classical the, uh, calculation according to geometric optics. I won't go through it, but the up upshot is right here. Um, this is the total momentum that's delivered to this mirror from the kick, both from here and the kick coming back there. And because r is greater than t, the mirror gets kicked in, right? And basically what's happening is even though this is a shallower angle, you would think it would get less momentum, but the number of photons coming through here is much greater than the number of photons coming through, through there, so it ends up getting kicked in. No big deal. Of course, quantum mechanics must give the same result. That's what the correspondence principle tells us. Um, and you know, this is what we've proven in experiments. So it's got to give that result. Um, the problem is the story that the two theories tell us. It's always, it was always thought that the, the stories were very similar in this correspondence limit, and it couldn't be more dramatically different. Um, uh, again, I won't go through the calcul calculations. I'll just give you the upshot. So <clears throat> classically, the reason that this mirror gets kicked into the inside of the inframeter is due to the photons that take this path, right? That's, the one, that's why it gets kicked in. There's no way of doing it otherwise. There's no way that unless the momentum delivered by these guys is greater than the momentum delivered by these guys that it could possibly go in. So you would think, in fact, that quantum mechanically, it's the, the photons in this path that are also responsible for kicking it inside. That is false. And that would be uh, what you would expect if there, there was a, I don't know, a benign transition from the, from the quantum to the, to, the, to the classical. So again, I won't go through the, the quantum calculations, um, this was just calculating. As it turns out, we've arranged things in such a way that the interaction between these photons and that mirror is, in fact, a weak value. This is calculating the weak value of the number of particles along these paths and, and the, the amount of momentum that it gives to it. Um, so this is the amount of momentum given by this path of the, of the particles. Um, so those are, again, the particles that end up in this detector, D1, are then giving another kick back this way. Right? And it turns out that those exactly cancel each other. So all the photons that end up in D1 end up giving no momentum kick to this mirror. And in fact, so you might ask then, how is it that the mirror goes inside? The mirror goes inside solely due to the photons that end up in this detector. And the reason for that is, again, the weak value of the number of, uh, the, of the momentum kick is, is 
uh, a negative number. It looks like an impossible thing, but this is a typical phenomenon that we see in, in, uh, in quantum mechanics. So uh, it, it rightly so gives the identical result, but the story is completely different. And classically, it's the photons that ended up here that give us the reason why the, the mirror gets kicked in. Quantum mechanically, it's the photons that end up in D2, which is the reason why the mirror gets kicked in. And this, uh, just to conclude this little uh, example, this actually serves as a very nice guide for our intuition. Mm -hmm. So suppose we uh, have a, a, situ a, a situation where we have a fluctuation where slightly more photons end up in the D1. So I just, I don't know if you notice, I, I'm starting off, I'm sending in photons. Here the wave packets are split at this beam splitter. They go through, they're reflected by the mirrors. They're about to go into the next beam splitter. There's the one from the left going through. There's the one from the right going through. The fluctuation just means that, so there's going to be slightly more particles going this way. Here we have destructive interference. Those go away. And, there we, and here's the fluctuation that's going through into the D1. Now you would think that, because there's more photons coming this way by this fluctuation, that it would get a bigger kick inside, right? That's what classical physics would tell us. That's what geometric optics would tell us. But in fact, it is not correct. Um, the, the correct quantum mechanical calculation would tell you that, in fact, it gets less of a momentum kick due to that fluctuation. So this has all kinds of implications. They're pretty dramatic. It's also an alternative way in which quantum mechanics could have been discovered originally by, through an effect like this. Um, OK. So um, here's one other example of strange things you can do weak, through weak measurements, becoming uh, uh, bigger and bigger. I like to call it quantum miracle or quantum stunt. It's called the quantum Cheshire cat. You know, I know the story from Alice in Wonderland, right? She's talking with a Cheshire cat, and then the line I like is she says, well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat, it's the most curious thing I've ever seen in my life. Well, by pre and post selection and weak measurements, you can indeed arrange a situation in which the grin of the cat is in one, you have one cat, right? You can arrange a situation in which the grin of the cat is in one box, the cat is in the other box with no grin. Of course, you can't do that with cats. You can do that with particles. So in some sense, it's like separating a particle from its properties. You can have the particle sitting in this box, but all the properties of the particle sitting in that box. It's magnetic field, it's spin, blah, 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 so on and so forth. So there's all kinds of, this is just another example of just how strange this, uh, this kind of uh, situation is. Um, and I like that this is, you know, Wheeler's kind of um, philosophy of, uh, uh, of his, uh, you know, relational reality, sort of the bootstrapping of, of reality that he uses. And I, I also like this quote by Maslow. He says, if your only tool is a hammer, then you tend to treat everything as if it were a nail. Well, up until, you know, I think that's how the physics world dealt with everything, right? We, the only good measurement is a strong measurement, is an ideal measurement. Um, I applied it to a couple other situations. Um, we've had, heard some talk about contextuality. This is the, uh, the Merman magic square. Um, here's an example of attempting to uh, create a hidden variable theory or um, well, assign values to all these, um, these observables, and you can see that it's impossible. Um, for example, if you were to multiply uh, these observables together, you would see that this row is equal to plus one, this row is equal to plus one, this row is equal to plus one. If you do it by columns, this column is plus one, that column is plus one, but this column is minus one. So if you were to try to replace those observables by numbers, of course, this is impossible, right? Because it's just nine numbers multiplied together. And if you reorganize them, it's been possible to go from getting a plus one, which is what you would get if you multiplied row by row, this, you know, row by row by row, versus a minus one if you wrote, multiplied column by column by column. So I also looked at this through weak measurements, and you can uh, uh, derive novel proofs of the contextuality of quantum mechanics, and get uh, unique signatures, um, which can be, could be tested experimentally. Those haven't been done yet. And also importantly, new restrictions on hidden variables. I think that it becomes increasingly extremely difficult with all the results coming out of weak measurements, weak values, considering hidden, hidden variables. It becomes increasingly difficult to, to, uh, to believe that, that, that this would work. A hidden variable picture would work uh, as a replacement for quantum mechanics. Anyway, that's, just, that's my opinion. So a couple of papers that I can refer you to. Okay, so I've done number two for you. I've shown that uh, it, this time symmetric quantum mechanics gave you new features that you would have never seen before. 
Now I'm going to give you a couple examples of, of, of this third category. These are simplifications and stimulated discoveries in other fields. I'm going to do it real quick. This is a real famous example. Um, I was interacting with one of my classmates from MIT, Paul Quiat, and he was a you know, very famous uh, quantum optics uh, expert. And um, it turns out that this very large weak values can be used for a very practical you know, technological purpose, which is to see physical phenomena that were normally thought to be impossible to be seen. It's used as an amplification, or a, maybe that's the wrong term. It's kind of like a geometric amplification uh, uh, scheme. So this is a, a famous example. Ephraim wrote a beautiful uh, news and views on it. Um, this is sort of a, the basic setup, but they're sending in uh, uh, photons. There's a slight birefringent crystal. You can, basically, you can't see the shift between them. Here's your post-selection, but due to this amplification effect, you can, at the end of the day, see them. And this also generated a lot of excitement. Many other experiments were done in, in all kinds of other contexts. In particular, I'm thinking by, about the Rochester group. They measured uh, femtoradian um, displacements. So to give you an example, if you shine the laser beam um, from Seattle to New York, uh, this weak measurement application technique would allow you to measure, to see a, a micron separation in those laser beams because they're going across the country. Or even more spectacular things. So you, in terms of, almost any kind of a sensor you can imagine uh, building, you can use this technique to build a better sensor. Uh, in, well, in many cases, not in all cases, but in, there's many cases where it helps. Okay, um, so that's it. one example of three. Oh boy, I'm never gonna get through this. Um, another example is the issue of non-locality. So we've heard a lot about the kinematic aspects of non-locality. There's a completely different kind of non-locality which I call dynamical, and you care called dynamical non-locality. Um, I was going to go through this example for, for the novices up here of how to understand um, the kinematic, the Bell's theorem type thing, but we don't really have time. Basically, here's a situation where you would like to believe that uh, the particle has properties when it leaves its source, and here's the quantum mechanical situation. You add a, a lever where you can look at it in X or Y. These are space-like separated. And it's easy to prove, given these quantum mechanical facts, that it's, you lead immediately to a contradiction. For example, if you were to um, measure x over here, assign green, this would mean by this rule right here that you would have to assign green to that guy, which also by this rule right here means you have to assign green to, uh, to the y position. And then using, uh, where are we? using this one right here, again, you have to assign green here, right? But that contradicts this result here. If you were to choose YY, they should be anti-correlated. So whammo, it's you know, a, a contradiction. But um, let me just emphasize there's a completely different kind of non-locality, which is dynamical non-locality. Classically, we never see this. In cosmic physics, the force has to act in an area where there's a, a gradient in the potential. right? And uh, in quantum mechanics, particularly with the Harmon and Bohm effect, that's not what happens. So, there's the, the Bell inequality violations, um, which is, has to do with the, the structure of Hilbert space. Here's an example of the Aron of Bohm effect. And this, this is a completely shielded region. Um, you can see the difference here. Here's a, there's a difference in the interference pattern. What happens is there's a magnetic field in this completely shielded region. And uh, Yakir de developed a whole new way of thinking about what really is happening there. He claims that there is a non-local interaction between the field in here and the electron or the particle going outside. And this we applied to um, the, the same ex example of the double slit. You know, uh, the big mystery, of course, is uh, if you're thinking about a single particle, how is it possible if the particle were to go to the right slit that opening or closing the left slit, uh, how could it know it, right? It looks perfectly uh, like no big mystery if you're thinking about waves, but if you're thinking about particles, it becomes a big mystery. And Feynman is famous for saying nobody knows how it can be like that. And you know, this is what we're taught. We're taught we have this thing called the wave function, right? Which is just an amplitude for probability. So when we actually look to see where the particle is, it's called you know, the wave-particle duality. Sometimes we see the particle on the left, and we have an identical wave function. And sometimes we see it on the right. Um, 
you know, it's, but it's nothing like, the quantum wave is nothing like a classical wave. Um, in fact, um, we've been working on, in fact, you can never see for a single particle the Schrodinger wave. It's impossible to see it. So why do we elevate it to, uh, uh, you know, an element of reality for a single particle? So it's particularly interesting to develop the physics of uh, the Heisenberg picture um, because you can think about, instead of a quantum wave that passes through the two slits, you can think about localized particles that which have non-local interactions with all the other slits. And the beauty of this is that, uh, so here's just the example uh, in quantum mechanics. It's a very general feature of standard picture of quantum mechanics that there are observables, there's an example of one, which obey non-local equations of motion. This is, this is just uh, you know, action at a distance. Now, you can never violate causality with it because you can also prove that exactly when you get in a situation, what looks like you can see this non-locality, the thing that's exchanged non-locally, something called a modular variable, becomes maximally uncertain, so it can't be seen. And again, there's no possible counterpart of that in, uh, in classical physics. But it turns out you can see it if you do weak measurements on it. Um, I don't have time to go through this, but here's, an, here's we proposed an experiment, and the experiment was done. Um, and so that opens up a whole different example. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this, so I'm running out of time. A lot of other examples of stimulating discoveries in other fields, particularly a whole new field of mathematics, where they now build these things called super oscillating lenses, which have been very, um, very useful, uh, technologically speaking. Okay, so I've given you that, and now I, in my last five minutes, I come to the, the big, uh, um, uh, the speculative part of, the, of the, the talk. Everything I've told you up to now is just a reformulation of the standard picture of quantum mechanics that must be true, and it's been verified to be true. Um, but here we get to the idea of a new theory, emergent quantum mechanics, or a generalization of quantum mechanics. So one example I'd like to give you, uh, uh, Yakir and, and Sandra Popescu and I became interested if we could reformulate physics, not from the way that it's usually been done in terms of time, by Parmenides, but by Heraclides, who said you never bathe twice in the same river. So the idea here is, uh, here's a, just a picture of a single classical particle at n moments in time. Here is uh, a mapping of that um, single particle into n particles um, at a given time, where there's a correlation between um, particle i and moment i over there. Classically, it's trivial, so you would think that each of these are sort of like an independent degree of freedom, something like that. So you, classically, you could say, yeah, we can do what Heraclides said you could do. Turns out, in quantum mechanics, you cannot. Um, and it has to do with something like what I was just showing with EPR, but not in space uh, with respect to time. Um, and the reason is a bit subtle. Um, if we had n particles, it turns out that there are these things called multi-time correlations. And if you use a standard picture of quantum mechanics, um, these multi-time correlations cannot be represented by the one-vector uh, picture or approach. Um, but you can do it using a two-vector approach. This is a, a part of a whole new way of thinking about physics, frankly, which um, has a lot of nice features. Um, this is what we use and allows us to uh, create a uh, EPR correlation between um, the post-selected state of a particle at this time with a pre-selected particle at that time Make a long story short, that allows us to stack things up and allows us to create this whole picture of each moment of time as a new universe. Um, uh, there's many beautiful aspects of it that I don't have time to go into, so I will unfortunately skip over. I'll maybe just mention one thing, that when you look at this picture um, and you believe in collapses, this is not necessarily implied that there's an arrow of time at a macroscopic level. Okay, I'll skip over this. Um, I'll skip over this. And I think I'll just come you know, usually, uh, come to my final point, usually we understand that there's, um, you know, different uh, physical levels in the universe, and they seem to be relatively separated in terms of the physics of them, um, or at least the, the connection between them is the usual bottom-up approach in physics. Um, um, and an issue that may be relevant to that question is the whole issue of uh, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Is there a transition between the quantum and the classical level? Or is there something like a many worlds picture? Mm -hmm. There's a very beautiful, though very speculative, uh, solution to the measurement problem. So this is uh, 
looks like a many world picture. This is a state of your particle going forwards in time. If you were to simply solve the measurement problem by saying that there is literally a destiny on the entire universe, that destiny, when you combine the two vectors together, <coughs> the solution to the measurement problem is simply that destiny vector picks out the, the end result. You don't have to destroy the linearity of, of quantum mechanics, so and so forth. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, Jan had mentioned the idea of, of top-down interactions. In general, that's a big no-no, I mean, for, for a bunch of reasons. But here's an example in which you can do that. Um, one of the problems of top-down causality is the stability of fluctuations. And this kind of top-down causality is stable of fluctuations because there are no fluctuations outside the entire universe. Mm. And you can also do all kinds of interesting physics on the nature of free will. And there's no, turns out there's no contradiction with having these, um, these destiny states in the whole business of free will. Uh, and uh, uh, the big question is, how do we come to a revolution in complexity? Where do we go? Um, you know, the bottom-up approach seems to be working very well. I do not have time to go to this, but there, this is also very speculative. But at least at, at fine time uh, scales, uh, we can get our effective Hamiltonian, our, our Schrodinger equation, as a superposition effect in which you can throw in all kinds of crazy things, crazy things that have potentials that seem impossible. OK, and so finally, uh, still open question. What's the uh, answer to the ontic epistemic? Strong measurements, weak measurements, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, still open question. So conclusion, if you're only two as a hammer and you tend to treat everything as a nail, rec I recommend uh, grasping the world more fully by grasping it gently. A little advertisement, got a new book out. Uh, this is the fest trip for Yakir for his 80th birthday. Um, also starting a new journal um, uh, in, in January. So I encourage you to, um, to send us articles, please. Um, uh, congratulations to Yakir for winning the National Medal of Science. Um, Obama said a very nice thing. He actually, the two things I talked about in this talk, he gave him the uh, medal for his work in quantum physics, which ranges from the AV effect, the notion of weak measurements, making one of the most influential figures in modern physics. So that was a lot of fun. I actually took that picture. Um, and the final, final thing, uh, we started a new institute. And here are a couple of the members. And I just want to wish the best to, to Francois and Glare on Tuesday. Uh, hopefully, he wins a Nobel Prize. Um, oh, and finally, once again, thank you to Fetzer for giving me a, a small grant, grant as a future graduate student. And, um, here is your final report. Thank you very much. <laughs>